Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, so um, this week we're presenting on Chapter 8, Two Wives. And I was actually very interested in presenting on this chapter. I, I wanted to, um, because in meetings, I often hear um, comments about this chapter. And I'm very interested in literature and history. And so I wanted to use it as an opportunity to do some online research about this chapter and learn more about why this chapter is in the current um, edition of the big book. Um, so I primarily use Google. And um, when I started um, Googling for information, I found pretty much not much of anything, actually, compared to what I could find on, say, um, Bill's story or the doctor's opinion, which there's a lot of um, history. So um, I did find a few sources, and as I read the chapter and followed along with some of the things I was finding online, I noticed um, that I started becoming rather resentful. And um, <laughs> I thought, wow, you know, I've been, I've been exposed to this chapter many times, and, and, and it didn't really affect me the way it had when I started really digging into it. And um, something I did learn um, is that um, it's noted that Bill W. wrote the chapter. Oh. Um, he did ask Anne, Dr. Bob's wife, to write the chapter. Um, however, she declined. And Lois, uh, Bill's wife, wanted to write the chapter, but he wouldn't let her. Oh. <laughs> so um, I started getting even a little more resentful. Oh. When, um, you know, the chapter starts on page 104, and the first three chapters are, are, excuse me, paragraphs are like an introduction, which is obvious that Bill would write the introduction. And then it starts out as, as wives of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's actually Bill writing, um, taking on the um, persona of a wife married to an alcoholic. And so I started becoming very um, critical, and I realized that... I was getting to the point where I didn't really even want to read what Bill W. has to say anymore, and I thought, this is not doing me any good. Um, the goal here is to increase my personal knowledge. The goal here is to be helpful to others. The goal is to find a way that this chapter could be helpful to those in such situations. Um, for me, that was quite a stretch. I did not live with an alcoholic, never have of this sort. But... Um, I did step back because resentments are the number one offender and um, the dubious luxury of people who don't um, drink out of anger. So I stepped back and took a more um, neutral view. And now I'm going to present what I found that could be helpful to people who are um, uh, affected by a loved one who is suffering with alcoholism. Um, so one thing I found that was helpful is that right on page 104, that we want to leave you with the feeling that no situation is too difficult and no unhappiness too great to be overcome. So that there is some hope um, that Families can be restored, um, friends can be restored, partners, um, loved ones. Um, although it is noted that that doesn't mean someone should stay in um, an abusive or um, relationship that is oppressive. So the gist of um, pages, the first several pages, um, is that aside from the alcoholics themselves, Nobody suffers more than those who are forced to watch a loved one suffer. And that um, folks who are 
deeply involved with someone um, suffering with alcoholism or challenged with alcoholism can often blame themselves for their loved one's disease, especially if they cannot identify past enabling behaviors. And I can connect with that because I drank while my children were growing up. Um, I didn't, um, uh, I wasn't angry with my children, but we always had a party atmosphere in the home. And my oldest son grew up learning that the way you uh, get through life is with chemicals. And um, I sometimes realized that he ended up dying and that that, you know, um, I can get into the point where I blame myself for that. And um, that is not helpful. Um, also, on page um, 105 near the bottom, it says we seldom had friends at our homes, never knowing how or when the um, members of our household would appear. And for the person who is not the alcoholic, they can become just as isolated as an alcoholic um, living in that situation um, due to fear. Um, there can be financial insecurity. Um, if uh, the bills and whatnot are shared, or the alcoholic is the um, head of household. Um, but also there's um, the disappointment of living with someone who tries to get help, tries to get better promises that they um, will stop drinking and often return to it unless they find a program of recovery. Um, also, then over on page, uh, I think, 108, um, I found a, a I've, I've heard, you know, many people um, approach this chapter by changing the pronouns to help them connect with it more. And there is a, a um, sentence on page 108 that reads, today, most of our men are better husbands and fathers than ever before. And so, um, you know, I would change that to today, most people who have found a program of recovery are better than ever before. And we see that, that people who find the program say they have found a better way of living even before they started drinking um, because the principles of AA are so helpful in everyday life, um, regardless of um, alcoholism or the um, status of having alcoholism or whatever. Um, and then there's a paragraph um, right after that, try not to condemn your alcoholic um, loved one, no matter what they say or do. Um, they are just another very sick, unreasonable person. Treat them when you can as though they have pneumonia. When they anger you, remember that they are very ill. And um, that can be kind of put people off a little bit, be a little um, like, so I'm supposed to be a doormat. I'm supposed to just take it and, and um, nurse this ill person. However, another way that um, I could look at it is, you know, when this chapter was written, the American Medical Association had not yet recognized alcoholism as a medical disease. Um, and um, so I can look at it like, try to view alcoholism as a medical disease. Um, and I can be angry and hurt, um, but I don't want to hold on to resentments because um, resentments are not good for me. Um, so then the book um, or the chapter, uh, Bill goes on to um, define sort of four categories of the alcoholic. Now, these categories are Bill's um, view, you know, at this, that it, it, these, that isn't a medical um, diagnosis or a list of symptoms, but basically um, the first category would be the heavy drinker. And um, heavy users um, can sometimes find a way to moderate or even stop altogether. And, um, but with a heavy drinker, when they do start, um, it's difficult for them to stop. Someone who may go to the holiday party intending to have one or two beers, but then ends up being an embarrassment um, and, and stops drinking for quite some time. 
Um, the second category is um, beyond a heavy drinker to someone who cannot moderate at all. Um, they may stay sober for um, periods of time, but um, they go back to using, they start losing friends, start um, losing um, maybe some trust in others, and perhaps have some problems with their jobs, school, things like that. Um, and they may recognize um, that they have a problem and want to stop. The third category, um, um, according to this chapter, would be people who uh, lose the majority of their friends. They may start spending some time in hospitals. Um, and um, their um, alcoholism starts to really have more serious consequences. And then the fourth category of this chapter, which um, I believe was intended to help families understand what they're going through and that they're not alone and that um, perhaps they can start to um, have some understanding of what's going on in their lives. Um, the fourth category would be the most tragic. Um, these would, according to the chapter, be people who may start being violent, um, abusive, lose jobs. And um, the big book even mentions um, in this chapter that in these situations, it might be a better idea for the person trying to maintain a relationship with this type of alcoholic to um, end that relationship and just take care of themselves. Um, but it is also mentioned that there are many people who do reach this point, such as myself, um, that do recover and that no situation um, is hopeless, um, usually. Yeah. So um, then the chapter goes on to um, give advice on how you deal with each category. So for the first category of the heavy drinker, um, they may not be an alcoholic, um, but that can, and they feel like they can stop whenever they want, but that can prove to be even more difficult for people who want them to get help because they don't recognize that they need to get help. And so then it is suggested that if the subject comes up naturally, perhaps the um, uh, person, the non-alcoholic person could mention the AA Big Book and um, the alcoholic or the heavy drinker may choose to read the book and realize that they have a problem and seek help. So um, that is what I learned to try to, you know, take a neutral stance and try to be the most helpful I could to others who might find some hope in this chapter. And I will turn it over to my friend, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Oof. All right. Um, I too, as I reviewed this chapter and thought about what are we doing here reading this and got my um, resentments up about about it. Um, I then recalled reading the set aside prayer and I thought I'd start my um, section uh, with sharing the set aside prayer. And the set aside prayer is one to use when we need greater mindfulness, when I need to be back in my beginner's mind, when I need some humility, when I need to let go and when I need to be open. So I'll just share the prayer. Higher power, Today, help me set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself, everything I think I know about others, and everything I think I know about my own recovery, so I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me see the truth. So that was helpful for me as I grounded myself to, um, to go through this, and um, like Kate, um, I modified a little bit how I looked at it to have it reflect my experience, strength, and hope um, in in the chapter here, being the alcoholic, 
and knowing that others around me love me. And um, regardless of the relationship to me that they suffered, like, you know, you, you, you know, it's the people that are around us that really suffer in addition to the alcoholic himself. And so I'm going to pick up basically on page 114 and uh, sorry, 112, wow. 112. <laughs> and um, we get told in how to deal with the alcoholic of type one, um, some principles of how people who love us, and this is how I look at this, people who love us, um, these are principles of dealing with an alcoholic, dealing with me. So if you're, if you love me and you're dealing with me, here are some things to know. Don't be angry. Don't be critical. Don't tell me what to do. Don't let me spoil your relationships with others. Don't yet set your heart on reforming me. I'm an alcoholic. I know I'm hurting others. I appreciate your kindness, patience, and helpfulness. Let me bring up the topic, communicate with me, drop the subject, ask me what I'd like to do, drop the subject, don't crowd me, plant the seed. And so these are the things if I'm an alcoholic and people who love me are trying to work with me um, and help me, these are the things that could potentially be helpful. Um, and so then what I did is I turned these into um, prayers. <laughs> so um, people who love me, please don't be angry with me. People who love me, please don't try to tell me what to do. People who love me, continue living your own life. People who love me, you're not the solution. I'm an alcoholic. I know I'm hurting others. I appreciate your kindness and patience and helpfulness. People who love me, please know this is a self-diagnosed disease. People who love me, please show me you care. People who love me, I'm ready when I'm ready. And um, that really, I think, sums up what I experienced as I read through and tried to understand for me what the people who loved me in my life might have been going through when I was an alcoholic. And if I had cared to admit I was an alcoholic before I came into the program, I might have if I had had some level of awareness, maybe if I was a level one drinker, I might have had enough awareness to say, hey, just simmer down, I'll be okay. Um, of course, I didn't do that. I was much more dramatic than that because I was probably not a level one drinker. Self-diagnosed. Okay. So uh, th what I really see here is like where Kate left off on like 110, 111, 112, um, what I really see here is a transition then into um, on page 114, like what the situations are like when we love someone and they're dealing with alcoholism. And we're told, and thanks for pointing out again, Kate, that this wasn't like diagnosed as a medical disease until I don't know when. I think 1953, but I'm not sure. 1953, okay. And so um, we do get some inclination here that there may be other mental health issues um, that need a doctor's support. And so if someone loves me and they see I'm struggling with alcoholism, I may have other things going on. And so um, you may need to lock me up. You may need to put me in treatment. I may need more help than just stopping drinking. And people who love me, sometimes no matter what you do, I'm doomed anyway, and it's not your fault. Um, that's what I see here too. It's like, you know, it's me. So um, you may need to lock me up. In my experience, I, I didn't have this much grace <laughs> with myself, nor with the people I loved when I was drinking. But I think, um, I think if I could go back and be conscious of what an asshole I was when I was drinking and what I was doing to the people who loved me around me, I might say some of these things that are here on pages 115 and 116. I might say some of these things to them. I might say, people who love me, please take care of yourself. People who love me, please get the help you need. People who love me, don't be embarrassed. It's okay if you talk to others. People who love me, protect the children but please don't turn them against me. People who love me, you don't need to vouch for me at work. 
people who love me ask me about my work when I'm dry so I can talk to you about it. People who love me, I know your economic security is also at stake. People who love me, pray for the right answer in this situation. People who love me, you too can benefit from the work I'm doing. People who love me, when you put spiritual principles to work in every part of your lives, you can have a great life too. Um, on the bottom of page 116, we get into um, kind of what this would be like if someone who loved me was there and I was open to receiving these things from, from this person. What I think this is really beautiful because um, I certainly was not aware of in early sobriety, aware of this. I certainly didn't take this approach um, as the alcoholic with the people who loved me around me. Um, but I can still do it now. <laughs> I can still do it now, right? So on the bottom of page 116, we get told what um, this can be like. So people who love me, I wish this for you. Lack of fear, lack of worry, lack of hurt feelings. I wish for you happiness. I wish for you learning. And I wish for you that we can overcome our mistakes. People who love me know that even though I'm trying, I'm going to be an asshole. And sometimes there's going to be irritation. Sometimes there's going to be hurt feelings and resentments. I'm going to be unreasonable. You might be unreasonable. I'm going to cr criticize. You might criticize. There might be thunderclouds of dispute that come out of the blue, out of nowhere, because I'm an alcoholic and because you love an alcoholic. And this is just how it will be. Um, people who love me know that I may be resentful. And if you dis disagree or criticize me, um, I'm, I might become even more resentful at you. Um, but know that in my heart, I'm going to do what I can to avoid um, disagreement and contention with you. So really laying out that um, I'm going to be imperfect. It's okay for you to be imperfect. And um, together, this can, this can be healed and this can be better. On page 118, um, we get into the fact that the alcoholic is pretty aware of what a horrible path they've, they've plowed in the soil. Um, and so there's a prayer there for me too. People who love me, I know I owe you. Please be patient, tolerant, understanding, and loving toward me. Know that I'm working toward my ideal self. So there's that paragraph in there that the person who loves us might want us to be this ideal person and just know that I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing my best. People who love me, you could not have cured me. Don't be angry with yourself. Only a higher power could cure me, but your devotion and care enabled me to the point that I could have a spiritual experience. So thank you. On page 119, people who love me, you are blessed. People who love me, please find ways to get your needs met with friends and activities and keep your health and needs in mind first. People who love me know that I need to spend time working on acting and acting to maintain my sobriety and join me on this where you can. So I might be busy on a Saturday morning at an AA meeting, um, but you know, support me in that if you can. And I love you and I won't do this per per perfectly, but you matter to me. People who love me, let's work together to find ways to give back, to do new things together. Now, it doesn't say this in the chapter, but I'm just going to put it this in here anyway. People who love me, let's have fun. Let's have fun. We're back in life again, right? And people who love me, I may stumble. I won't always live up to my new way of life. Please stand by me in these times if it's healthy for you. I'm almost done. Don't worry. Page 120. <laughs> People who love me, when you're intolerant, know that I may use it as an excuse to drink or to drink at you. And this may happen. And it's okay. And it's not your fault. People who love me, you can't save me. You can't remove temptation. You're not the cause of my drinking, nor are you the solution. People who love me, either my higher power has removed my liquor problem or my higher power has not. People who love me, I just told you a lot of information. So we, we've just been lectured at in this chapter. So people who love me, I just told you a lot, maybe too much. 
I'm sharing this with you because you're not alone. You are worthy. I love you. And I want you to have a good life too. People who love me, thank you for accepting me in whatever way you can. And people who love me, good luck and may your higher power be with you. So that's the approach I took when looking at this was, um, you know, I'm the alcoholic and there are a lot of people who love me out there. And um, there, I'm, I'm grateful that there's some type of guideline for them. And of course, now we have Al-Anon and this was written before Al-Anon. Um, but it's um, helpful for me to know that there are things out there to help the people who love me so that they can feel well for themselves and that I might re recover in community um, with other alcoholics and that all together we can have fun. We can be on the broad highway to happiness even when we make mistakes. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.